The scripture reading is found in 2 Peter chapter 1. I asked Daryl if this is the start of a new series, and he said yes. So we'll be going through, through 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11, and I'll give you guys a moment to get there. Second Peter chapter 1, and I'll start at verse 1. Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to su supplement your faith with, good with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For these qualities are yours and are increasing. You will keep from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly supplied to you. Uh, it is now time for, for Children's Church, and I'll invite Daryl up for the message. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you here this morning. I see we have uh, uh, some visitors, which is great, because we sure have a lot of people missing this morning. Uh, of our regular attenders. But uh, one of the things that I praise God for is that uh, a young man who grew up in this congregation, uh, he has gotten married. He is now attending the Bagot Community Chapel. His name's Travis Martins. He's getting baptized this morning. Uh, him and his wife attended Bagot, and so a good number of folks from our congregation are attending that baptism. And we praise God for that. Uh, another thing, I'm just gonna, we're kind of empty on youth this morning. I'm not sure what that is. I was going to ask, how many people have served at camp this past summer? You want to just put up your hand? One? Okay. <laughs> I know we had a lot more than that uh, because Jaira was there all summer long and so was Julie Nelson. And uh, yeah, Amy, you were just there last week as a speaker at, at, at Gimli Bible Camp. And, but we've had, uh, I think, a number. So this past week is, was, our, was the last week of camp for most camps. And so it behooves us as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to continue to pray for the kids who saw the seeds, you know, who had the seeds of the words of life sowed in them. Uh, some kids came, became believers in Christ. Uh, some just heard the gospel and are thinking about it. And so uh, we need to continue to pray that God will use the truth of his word to continue to work in the lives of these kids who've been at camp. You know, for some kids, the only spiritual input they ever get is when they go to camp for one week of the year. And they hunger for it. Uh, actually, the former, uh, the wife of the former director of Valley View Bible Camp, that was her story. She came from a non-Christian home, but she kept going to camp year after year. God used the camp ministry to disciple her. And uh, as a result, she ended up being in ministry in that camp ministry. We also have a number of young people who are headed to Bible college. I counted seven. Uh, I see one here. I see Robin. Uh, but uh, I've, I've, I hear that Nicholas and Shane are going back for their fourth year at Miller as part of a, an internship. Uh, the Jaira and Bowen and Kirsten and Sarah are also headed to uh, 
on Miller and Perry. So I think we have we have something to praise God about that God has uh, impressed upon the hearts of young people in our congregation to train themselves, to prepare themselves for future ministry. That's great to see. That's excellent. So, maybe before I get into my message, I'll just stop for a word of prayer. Let's bow. Father, we give you thanks uh, for working in our church family, for working through us, for working in us, for not giving up on us, for continuing to work uh, all through our lives uh, while we're here down on this earth. And so, Lord, uh, we would pray for uh, those who are stepping out uh, as a first time, doing things that uh, that's all brand new to them. And so we would ask for your strength and for your courage and for your sustaining power for them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm beginning the start of a new series in 2 Peter. Uh, I think a while back I uh, was preaching through 1 Peter back in the spring and then uh, I took a, I think we went to Titus for a bit as long as well as all the other preaching we've had from, uh, from men from our congregation. And, and I got to tell you, I've been appreciating hearing God preach, uh, God speak through men, some in their 70s and some in their early 20s, I think, or even uh, that have been preaching in our church. And I'm, I'm just delighted to, to see, to hear the message of God from God's Word preached by, by different men from our congregation. But anyway, I'm, I'm going back or going to preach through Second Peter uh, in a series. And so we're looking at, at uh, chapter 1 this morning, or the first part of chapter 1. And uh, the author of this letter is none other than Peter. There's been some who've questioned that on a couple of points. Some says, well, its literary style is different from that of the first letter of Peter. And uh, I would counter that with sometimes over time you you sound different than you did before. When I write a message now, or uh, write out a sermon, it's different than it was five years ago. It's different than it was ten years ago. But also we got to remember that it was Sylvanus who penned the letter for Peter. We look at chapter uh, 5, verse 12 of 1 Peter, and it was, Sylvanus was the scribe. And so it's a very good possibility that Peter had somebody else write, or he dictated and write this letter for him. But uh, to counter that argument as well, that it's not Peter writing this letter, people who knew the Apostle Peter were still very active in the community to which this letter was sent, uh, to which this letter was written. And in fact, the Apostle John, who was a very close friend of Peter's, was the overseer of the church, or at least the western part of that church, uh, to the region to which this letter was sent. This was Asia Minor. It's the region which is now the country of Turkey. And the Apostle John, who was still alive for at least another 30 years after this letter was written, would have had ample opportunity to denounce that this letter was written by somebody else had he believed it to be written by somebody other than his close friend Peter. Okay. Another objection was is that the content of this letter, 2 Peter, is very similar to what was written by the Apostle Jude. And uh, an answer to that is Peter may have included important truths that were previously written by Jude for the spiritual benefit of his readers. The date of this letter is somewhere between 64 and 67 AD. Uh, after P it's obviously after Peter's first letter and before Peter's death. And uh, Nero, Emperor Nero, the wicked one, he died in 68 AD. And uh, we know from Peter's words uh, in verse chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, that he's sure that he's not going to live much longer. 
Uh, and uh, church tradition holds that Peter was martyred. He was actually crucified under Emperor Nero's rule. So we can kind of deduce that it's somewhere between 64 and 67 AD. Some people, scholars give it the day uh, about a 65. So we can't say for certain exactly, but in that time frame. Who was the original audience of this book, of this letter? Was it the same as 1 Peter? Probably. Probably it was the same audience because he's writing, I've written to you a letter before, now I'm writing again. Now I'm giving it to you again. And so he's writing to believers. He, he sets that out first thing in his introduction. He says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind or same value as ours by the righteousness of God, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the background to this is the first letter that Peter wrote, 1 Peter, and the, the main themes of that, I would give you the four S's are salvation, sanctification, suffering, and service were the main themes of Peter's first letter. It was a lot of uh, instruction on how to face suffering or persecution from those outside the faith. It says, beware, you know, Satan uh, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so for a lot of Peter's readers in that time period, in that Roman Empire, in that location, the threat of physical harm was a very real threat. And Peter addresses that in his first uh, letter. So those four S's of salvation, sanctification, suffering, and service were for, in, for his first letter. But in this second letter, Peter again speaks of salvation and sanctification but he also adds three more. One is scriptures. That's another S word. Sacrilege. That's due, uh, sacrilege is just an S word for false teaching. False, false, you know, uh, heresy, I guess. And then lastly, no S word here. I didn't know how to put that one into S's, but it's the return of Christ. So that's kind of uh, the main themes of this second letter. We're going to look at the outline to this book as just as an opener. The first two verses of chapter one are the introduction or the greeting. Uh, verses uh, three to 11 are encouragement to growth in Christlikeness or sanctification. Uh, verses uh, 16 to 18, or 12 to 15, sorry, are Peter's reason for writing this letter. So let's just look at it. Let's look at the reason for writing this letter. Let's read it together, starting at verse 12. It says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminding reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also the Lord Jesus has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Peter is saying, the Lord has made known to me, I'm not going to be around for much longer. And so I want you to remember this. I want you to think about this. Don't forget what I'm trying to tell you. Actually, you go on to uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. We'll read it as well. He says, This now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the word spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. He wants to remind them of things they already know, they've already heard. But if the readers, the believers in the first century are anything like us, we forget, don't we? We need reminders of things we already know because we forget. Well, we know them, but we don't apply them. But Peter wants to remind them to apply them. 
Verses 16 to 18 of chapter 1 is Peter's message. He declares to them as a result of his own eyewitness experience. We're not making this up. And then he tells them of some of what he saw, what he heard while he was in the presence of Jesus. In verses 19 to 21, he speaks of Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, attesting to the reliability of the scriptures that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, verses the whole chapter, is a warning against the influence of false teachers. Uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 13, are a reminder of the coming of the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord Jesus. At the end of chapter 3, verses 14 to 18, he gives his readers some concluding exhortations. So we're going to start off with the introduction that Peter has. He starts off that he is a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Another way of saying that would, I am a lifelong slave and a messenger. I'm a lifelong slave and a messenger of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to those who have the same kind of faith or value of faith as we have. He's referring to himself and other believers. And then he goes on to describe the basis for their common faith. And that is the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the basis for their common faith. Because the righteousness of God the Father demands that sin be atoned for and the righteousness of God the Son enabled him to make atonement for sin and when a person accepts the atonement of Jesus for his or her sin debt towards God then God the Father credits the righteousness of Jesus to that person's account and I'm thankful for that you know, I thought of, of, of a way of illustrating that point. Um, say for our righteousness, let's see for an example, in my own righteousness, I've got a bag, it's a burlap bag, you know, it's porous, full of wheat. Ah, half full of wheat. Full of wheat is too heavy for me. But let's just say that I, I that represents my righteousness. But if I carry that bag of wheat, or that half bag of wheat around, you know, in that burlap bag, and it, you know, I go outside and it gets rained on and my, my, my righteous bag gets soaked, and uh, the seeds inside of that righteous bag start to sprout, or they start to rot, and then I leave it out in the cold and it freezes, and, and after not a very long time, my bag of righteousness is not really good. Uh, it's going to turn to something repulsive in a very short time. But instead of my bag of righteousness that I'm in, I look to Jesus and, and he's got a 50,000 bushel bin full of clean grain that's stored and will last for years and years. That's credited to my account. I'm grateful for that. Jesus' righteousness is covering me. I'm good enough to go to heaven because Jesus' righteousness surrounds me, envelops me. God sees me and says, yep, because of Christ's righteousness covering Daryl, he's good enough to go to heaven positionally. I also want you to note Peter's emphasis right off the hop on the deity of Jesus Christ. What he says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, in this short letter, he emphasizes that again another four times. See, that's part of contradicting or part of refuting false teaching. Because a lot of false teaching goes against the person of Jesus Christ. Not that many years ago, the moderator of the largest Protestant denomination in our country went on public television as permanent record saying, Jesus Christ was a good man, but he definitely was not God. 
This is from the leader at that time of the largest Protestant denomination in our country. Peter refutes that moderator long before that moderator came up with that idea by saying repeatedly five times in this short letter, reaffirming the deity that Jesus Christ was indeed God, God the Son. Well, verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you. The Hebrew greeting is shalom, which means peace. Paul the Apostle, John, and Peter often use grace and peace, so that's a Christian greeting for Jew or Gentile believer alike, because without God's grace toward us, there would be no peace with God for us. And Peter is blessing his readers not with just a small portion of this grace and peace, but he is asking God to, to multiply, to double or to triple or quadruple whatever what they have, what grace and peace they have as they get to know God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, more and more. So that is the introduction to this letter. As we read through it, verses 3 to 11, we're going to see this section is for encouragement to growth in Christ-likeness. And I would say that is sanctification, being set apart for useful, noble purposes. And not only is God's grace the source of our salvation and our peace with God, but God's grace is also what enables believers to live a a godly life. Believers in Christ have been saved to live in harmony with the moral character of their Savior. God has empowered us. He has given believers everything they need to live righteous lives. That's in verse 3. To illustrate that, I want you to think of this analogy. I want you to think of an individual who hires a carpenter to build a house. And this guy, this person, I'm going to call him the boss, is going to give uh, the contractor, the person he hired to build this house, he's going to give it to him when it's done. Pretty good deal, eh? And now this carpenter that the boss has hired, he has nothing. And he doesn't know anything either. And he doesn't have any tools. And he has no materials. And he doesn't have any money to buy any of those things. And he doesn't have any credit to borrow money to get any of those things. And so the boss who is hiring this carpenter has to supply everything. He even has to supply the food and lodging and clothing and even the medical care for this pathetic carpenter. And the boss even has to work with this carpenter all day, every day, to teach him step by step how to build this house. This is a bit of a picture of what God supplies to his children to enable them to build or to live a God-honoring life. And so here are some of the things that God has given us. First of all, he's given us his word, his communication to us, his promises, his commands, his principles. He's given to us examples, both good and bad. He's given us his story. He's shown us our story. He's given us prophecy of what yet will be. He's given us his word. He's also given us his Holy Spirit to live in us as believers. And that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand and apply God's truth. The Holy Spirit empowers us for service. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts so that we can serve more effectively. God has also given us forgiveness of sin. He's given us a father-child relationship. We can come to him crying out, Abba, Father. We can come boldly before his throne of grace because we are his children. He's given us the ability to communicate with him in prayer. 
He's given us a way to escape uh, temptation in order to have victory over sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with that temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He's given us the church, other believers to worship with, to fellowship with, to be ministered by, and also to minister to. He's also promised us an eternal home with Him. He's given, He's promised us eternal rewards to enjoy while believers live in that eternal home. He's also promised that here on this earth, whether here on this earth or in heaven, He would never forsake those who are truly His own by faith. Why did He give us all this? So that we as believers could partake or share in His divine nature so that we would become more and more like Jesus Christ and less and less like the unbelieving world. That is what God did for His children. He started the process. He initiated us. But we as believers have a responsibility as well. In salvation, God has provided everything. But we still have the responsibility to repent of our sin and trust in the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In our sanctification or our spiritual maturity process, believers have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to cooperate with God in accomplishing His desire for our lives. Let's go back to that illustration of the pathetic carpenter who has nothing and who knows nothing. If he leaves the building in sight and goes off to the fishing hole, how much of his house is going to get done? Not much. You see, the boss isn't going to work on it without the carpenter working on it as well. And so how quickly and how well that house gets done is dependent on how much that carpenter is willing to work for and work with his boss, the Lord Jesus. And so this is why Peter tells believers to make every effort to supplement their faith. And he lists seven qualities that to supplement their faith with. The first is virtue or moral excellence or goodness, as some of your Bibles will have it. In, in doing what God says is right, even when it is the hard thing to do. The second is knowledge. The Greek word there is gnosis to come to know, to recognize, to understand or perceive, to know the living God and know His will for your life. You know, it's something that the Apostle Paul also prayed for when he's writing to the Colossian believers, and he prays that you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So add knowledge to your faith. Goodness or moral excellence, virtue and knowledge. Knowledge of God's will, knowledge of God himself, knowing God. Third is self-control or temperance. The Greek word there is egratia, which means mastery or self-control. Not losing control of your temper, not losing control of your tongue, not losing control of your body, not losing control of your thoughts. I think it was Warren Wearsby who made this quote, or I'm not sure it was original with him, but it's not original with me. But the quote is, almost everyone who is incarcerated, that means in jail, is there because they didn't control themselves. They allowed themselves to do something that they knew was wrong. Another thing to add to your faith is perseverance or steadfastness, patient endurance. The Greek word is hupomone, one who stays behind and patiently endures difficulty. That's hupomone. Someone who sticks it out through the difficult times and continues to do what is right, what is good, what is best for others, even though it's tough. Perseverance, steadfastness. You know, 
The Bible is full of examples of men who started well, who began well, serving in whatever capacity God entrusted to them, but didn't have perseverance, didn't have steadfastness, and they gave up part way through. Okay. Number five is godliness. The Greek word is eusebia, good or well worshiping. Somebody who worships God well. You know, from the Bible, we know that worship was often done through prayer. Worship was done through song and through music. But obedience to God is just as much worship as singing beautifully. We all remember the story of King Saul, right? Back in Old Testament times, part of worship was offering sacrifices. Okay? You wanted to worship God. You gave up something that was of value to you, giving it to God, saying, you are worthy of whatever I can give you. And so King Saul was disobedient when he was told to destroy all the animals of, of a certain thing. It was the Amalekite region or whatever, and not bring anything back alive. And he brings back the best of the stuff. And Samuel confronts him and says, Hey, I hear bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen. What's the deal here? And Saul responds, Well... We, the people brought it back so we could sacrifice it to the Lord to worship God with this stuff. And Samuel's response is, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. You know, a thousand years later, the Holy Spirit ins inspired the Apostle Paul to urge believers to present their whole bodies to God as living and holy sacrifices. This is what God desires. It's acceptable worship to Him. It's worship that pleases Him. It's obedience that pleases. That's the worship that God desires. Surrendering to His will for our lives. Sixthly, the thing that believers need to add to their faith is brotherly kindness or brotherly affection. The Greek word there is Philadelphia. We're familiar with that word because we have a city in the country next to us that's called Philadelphia. It's called the city of brotherly love. I don't know about you, when I was growing up, the Philadelphia Flyers were the dirtiest team in the NHL. And uh, it was kind of ironic, and some commentators, Marvion, like here they were, the, the, the roughest, dirtiest team, and they came from the city of brotherly love. It didn't quite square. But anyway, brotherly love, mutual affliction. It's looking out for members of our family, those who are in the family of God, looking out for their well-being. You know what, to illustrate this, uh, a number of years ago, when our son Matt was going to Bible camp for the very first time, he was eight years old. The thing was... At Valley View Bible Camp, he had three older sisters who were working there as staff at that time. And each of them wanted to make sure he was doing okay, being away from mom and dad for, for the first time for a week, you know, uh, going to camp. And uh, there was one, I don't know if they kept checking up on him, one time, I think it was Amy, was checking on him, and uh, he quietly told her that she could go now because his other two sisters had already come and checked up on him that evening, and he was feeling a little smothered and even embarrassed in front of his cabin mates because his older sisters were continually making sure he was okay. okay. But that was good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad his older sisters cared for him and wanted to make sure he was okay, seeing that if, you know, if they could do something if it wasn't okay. And lastly, seven, love or charity. The Greek word there is agape, means sacrificial love, putting the needs of others before our own. In verse 
verse 8, Peter says, the more you grow in these areas, the more you grow, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be productive, you will be pro, uh, useful in knowing Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that we can have a lot of head knowledge, we can know, but not put that knowledge of Jesus into practice. That's probably one of our biggest faults as Christians, isn't it? We can know all about the Lord Jesus. We know the Bible. We've studied it. You know, we've gone to Bible, you know, Sunday school and, and Bible camp and Bible college or whatever, and we read devotionals. And we can know a lot. But if we don't put it into practice, like James says, what good is it, you know, if you're a hearer of the word but not a doer of it? Yeah. On the other hand, you know, if you, would be, if you are increasing in these areas, your knowledge will be useful. But if you don't think developing these character qualities in your life isn't important, then you're short-sighted. You're even blind. You've forgotten the awfulness of sin that God saved you from. You've probably forgotten the price that Christ paid in order to forgive you from your sin. Maybe you've forgotten the terrible consequences of giving in to sin, of living in sin. Maybe you're living for the pleasures of this world more than living for the purpose of bringing others into God's family. And so Peter encourages believers not to be short-sighted, but to be all the more diligent, to make certain about God's calling and choosing them. Confirm God's calling and choosing you. God knows your heart. You cannot earn your salvation. Remember, it's a gift of His grace toward us. But each and every believer has the responsibility to represent his or her father well before a lost and dying world. A few years ago, I became aware of a fellow that I knew just briefly who had passed away very, very suddenly. And I asked a Christian man who knew this fellow quite well if he was a believer. Uh, he was this fellow that I knew. I, I knew both of them, but I knew one better than the other. And so I asked this fellow, Joe, like, uh, was this fellow a believer that just passed away? And he paused and he was hesitant and he says, I can't say for sure. God knows his heart. That's what he told me. So I read the obituary of this fellow who just passed away so suddenly in an accident, and I read he was a member of an evangelical church. Okay. But there must have been some lack of evidence of a changed life for my friend, who I trust his judgment, to say, I can't say for sure. You know, my hope for myself and also for each one of us here today and each one of us in this congregation is that if someone were to ask anyone who knows us at all if we are Christians if we are followers of Christ that person would be able to say without hesitation oh yeah he's a believer he's a follower of Jesus okay. Peter's plea for his readers was similar he says for as long as you practice these things you will never stumble or fall away and the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. The New Living Translation trans translates it this way. says, Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I read these words, I think of the story that Jesus told about a master who entrusted possessions and responsibility to several different of his servants, several different uh, members of his servants. And to some of his servants who had served him well, his words were, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. 
You know, wouldn't it be great if each and every believer in Christ would hear those words? Uh, somehow, I doubt that that will be the case for every person who calls themselves a follower of Christ. In fact, for some people who call themselves followers of Christ, we read Jesus' words will say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. I'm assuming that those will pe be people who follow a form of Christianity, but who are relying on their own righteousness instead of confessing their need of God's righteousness imputed to them through the Lord Jesus. But I also believe that it is quite possible that many believers will be in heaven and for a time will look back with regret for not having given their Lord their all. You've probably heard the term in regard to a sports term team. They left it all out there on the field or out on the, on the ice or whatever. And the meaning of that term is that they gave every bit of themselves during that game, that important game. They could have given no better effort than what they gave. And I think for many of us believers, when we face the judgment of believers, the Apostle Paul, Paul tells, talks about in 2 Corinthians, it's called the Bema judgment. I think it will be a time when we will wish that we'd left it all out there for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we will wish that we'd, we couldn't, we'd given everything of ourselves, we couldn't have given any better effort than we did. It'll probably be a time when we wished we'd spend our time and energy on this earth somewhat differently. And so one of the main reasons that the Apostle Peter wrote this letter was to encourage believers to live in such a way as to prevent regrets in heaven. And I'm glad that God the Holy Spirit preserved this letter to help us live in such a way so that we can prevent our regrets when we get to heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for inspiring Peter to write a letter of encouragement, of challenge, of truth to people who needed to hear it. And so, Father, we need to hear this letter as well. We need to hear it more than once. We ask that you would help us to remember the truths in it, help us to live our lives so that we won't have regrets when we stand before your throne and our works before you are judged uh, as to what position that you will give us in your eternal kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uncle David. Shall we stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision?
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Pardon me.